could you put your hands up if you've heard of the Kahui twins? Could you put your hands up if you've heard of Nia Glassy? And could you put your hands up if you've heard of James Fakaruru? Could you put your hands up if you've heard of the Nelson twins? Could you put your hands up if you've heard of Timothy Mabin, Samantha Nelson? The first three sets of names, which nearly all of you knew, were the names of Māori children killed by their caregivers. The second set of names I gave you, which hardly anyone knew, were Pākehā children killed by their caregivers. Since 1840, when a different intellectual tradition came to this country, the research that was done, has been done, and continues to be done on Māori people has by and large come from somewhere else. It has not been mostly research with people, it has been research into people. We are compared to somebody else. And the moment you get into comparative research, you actually establish a norm, a point of reference against which you measure everyone else. And too often it seems to me the norm or the point of reference is park our people against which we are measured. And so we have findings that there is a disproportionate number of Māori men in prison compared to Pākehā men. There is a disproportionate number of Māori with serious drug addiction problems and so on. What I think a Māori intellectual tradition teaches us, that if you make a comparison, you compare the people under study with the context to which they belong. You compare them with the culture which shapes them. You compare them with the history of what has happened to that culture. You do not compare them to somebody else. And the reason I feel particularly strongly about that is that the research then becomes skewed, not so much by the researchers themselves, but by the media who often pick up the research in sound bites and peripheral analysis. Research is a product of the, of the European Enlightenment, which occurred, as you will know, in the 17th and 18th centuries, when the scientific method replaced what Voltaire called the profound superstitions and untruths of organised religion. And the scientific method became a new way of seeing the world. But like all traditions, that wonderful, enlightened, new approach also built around itself its own almost quasi-religious aura. That if the method was objective, then so must be the people implementing the method. And that, of course, is not necessarily the case. The notion of a warrior gene as a scientific fact is actually based on the history of a scientific and cultural lie. And that is the notion of a warrior race. The warrior race suggests that there are certain races of people who were born to fight, to be violent, and to kill. It was described most graphically, I think, by one of the first English writers about our country who had never actually visited here. <laughs> but in 1830 wrote that the land is inhabited by savage, bloody warrior race, by a savage, bloody warrior race, where vengeance and war is the precious lifeblood of an ancestor bequeathed from savage father to savage son. Where did that image come from? Where did the novelist Alan Duff 
get the idea of naming his novel Once Were Warriors, when a clear and actually objective analysis of our society would have shown that the book could more properly have been called Once Were Gardeners, Once were poets, once were singers, and if you're from Kahunganu, once and always were lovers. <laughs> so where did the idea come from? When a man called Christopher Columbus set sail for India to find the quickest route to the lucrative spice markets in India, he ended up in the Caribbean. He found no spice, he found no gold, no diamonds. And so he returned to Europe empty-handed, except for a few indigenous peoples whom he had captured and took back to Spain to sell his slaves. But knowing that his life and his future adventures may be at risk, because he came back empty-handed, he did what all entrepreneurs do in that situation, I think. He lied. He said he couldn't quite reach it, but there was actually a place called El Dorado. And Dor, of course, is the Spanish word for gold, so El Dorado was a city of gold. Other countries heard about this El Dorado, and they funded adventurers to find it as well. One of them was an Englishman called Sir Walter Raleigh. He set off to find El Dorado, and he was basically given an ultimatum by Queen Elizabeth that if he didn't find it, then he would die. He didn't find it, of course, because it didn't exist. It was a fantasy. But when he returned to England, he too had to explain why he didn't find the fantasy. And so for the first time that we are aware of, the term warrior race appears in European writing. Because Walter Raleigh said in his report to the court of Queen Elizabeth that he got close to El Dorado, but was prevented from entering the city because the land was occupied by a savage warrior race who kill and eat anyone not like them. And from that one simple lie to justify a failure came the notion that all indigenous peoples were warrior races. It puzzles me as a non-scientist how a scientist can say there is a warrior gene knowing the history of that fantasy. And when I discussed this at a conference in the United States last year, a young Mohawk scientist announced after when he gave up to give the vote of thanks to me, he asked me not to worry because he was doing some research which would undoubtedly prove that people from Europe had a colonizing gene. And perhaps the shock horror that greeted that announcement <laughs> should have been matched with an equal shock and horror greeting the announcement of the warrior gene. And that to me is one of the perils of research, one of the perils as accepting as objective something which may in fact be far from objective, accepting as provable truth something which may actually just be a reaffirmation of old and bitter prejudices.